stitches. Well, good morning. Good morning. Glad you're here this morning. Thank you for coming today. And if this is your first time here, um, if you go to our church website, there is a button at the top that says first time visitor. We'd love for you just to give us a little bit of information about yourself. And if you do that, we will we will actually send five dollars to a charity. There's four charities listed there, local charities, uh, one national charity, and we'd love to send that in your name. Um, if you have a prayer request, please make sure that you go to the website. There's a place where you can leave prayers, or you can send an email to prayer at livingfaithmc. Info, or you can give the church office a call, or you can call me, or you can call Miss Fran. She will also take your prayer, and that will also get to me, and we will send that out to everybody. Um, if you can find your announcements on the church website, I apologize. I did not get the email out this morning. This afternoon, I will get the email out to everybody that has all of the announcements on it. Uh, just a real quick one. Um, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be going down to um, Forgotten Children. And so we'd love for you to join us. Um, we're going to help them uh, actually fold some clothes. Uh, you will need to wear a mask, so I just want to let you know that. So please uh, join us if you can on Tuesday night. Um, birthdays today, Linda Spillers will celebrate her birthday on Friday. There are no anniversaries. So I'm just going to ask you to stay seated, and we're going to pray, and we'll get started with uh, the message here. Father, we praise you this morning. We just thank you, Lord, that uh, you are God, and that you love us. You died for us. You created us. You wove us together in our mother's womb. You know us, and yet you still love us. You know us intimately. You know us better than we know ourselves. And Lord, you have great plans for us if we would just walk in them. You have good works planned for us if we would just walk in them. Help us to walk in those good works that you created beforehand. Because we are your creation. Through Christ Jesus, we love you and we praise you. Be with us today, Lord, as we listen to your words from Scripture. These are not my words, Lord. These are yours. I just ask that our hearts will be open, that we would hear the message that the Holy Spirit has for us today, and that we would just not go here saying, oh, that was a great message, but that we would apply it to our lives daily as we walk in your ways. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Just wanted to give you that little update. We are in uh, the book of Acts. Oh, oh one more thing. I, I, this one, I almost forgot about this. We are having the church picnic today, but if you looked on the board, there were only three of us that were going to race our lawnmowers, which actually probably would have been kind of fun, but two of them have backed out because they're sick, or there's sick, they're sickness in the family. So I didn't think it would be a whole lot of fun to watch me go around in circles. So if you want to see a race, if you want to see a race, come to my house. I think maybe Wednesday I'll be mowing the lawn. And we can set up chairs and you can sit outside and you can watch me run around their yard. I'll even supply iced tea. How about that? I'll even make it sweet for those who lack sweet tea. <laughs> so and we aren't gonna, we're going to have the picnic, but we're not going to have the lawnmower races today. So... I was saying earlier, I think we need to wait till the lawn is a little bigger, a little higher, and then we could have lawnmower races and mow the lawn while we're doing it. But that's just my, my honoring is coming out. But all right, so back to, back to all seriousness. Uh, but I wanted to let you know that that's why we're not out there doing lawnmower races, because the other two guys had sickness in the family. And, and speaking of that, because I know that the Barsley said it's okay for me to share this, um, both the girls are, 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 are ill. Um, Audrey passed out yesterday. And so pray for, for, for Audrey Barsley. And Rachel's been dealing with something they knew was coming. It's kind of a genetic thing, but she's been feeling very sick. That's why she hasn't been up here singing with us. Um, so please pray for the Barsleys as they deal with that, along with the fact I'm not sure. Well, I'll just leave it at that. Just make sure that you be praying for, for Rachel and Audrey Barsley this week as they are dealing with um, a lot of issues. So, And as you know, when our kids are sick, parents deal with a lot of stress. So please pray for them. Again, back. We are back. We are in the book of Acts. Um, if you remember up to this time, we've, we've had a lot happen. Uh, we had Pentecost. We had, uh, we had uh, uh, things going on in Jerusalem. And then, and then Stephen is stoned. And now Saul has been, had his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And now he is out spreading the gospel but we come to chapter 10, and chapter 10 is what I would call probably a very pivotal 
a very pivotal book, a very pivotal chapter in the book of Acts. Because up to this time, the gospel has been very Jewish. You know, we, 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 were, in, we were in Jerusalem most of the time, and most of the other areas we're seeing is God reclaiming the promised land. He's going to Samaria. He's going to these different places that he's reclaiming, but it's still remaining mostly a Jewish gospel. And now we're going to see, much to the surprise of the Jewish church, we're going to actually see them venture into the Gentile areas. You know, in, in Matthew 16, when Jesus was talking to Peter, he tells Peter that I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And we always wonder, what does that mean? I mean, I, I think of, you know, like when, when a dignitary would come to town, you know, they'd give him this giant key, you know. So did Jesus give Peter this set of keys that had a tag on it that said heaven? You know, what, is, what did he mean by that? And I, we're going to see what that, what that entailed. What, is, what was the keys to the heaven? But, but Peter's given this, and what he has given, I believe, what the keys to the kingdom of heaven are, I think the keys is preaching the gospel. Because when we preach the gospel, people believe in Christ, and they will have access to heaven. So Peter is opening the door to heaven with his preaching. He's been using these keys. He used it at Pentecost in Acts 2. And all, you know, 3,000 people came to the faith at that day. He used it in, in the temple with a lame man, and 5,000 people believed in Christ. They used it in Samaria. When, when uh, Philip was in Samaria, and he's sharing the gospel, and, the, and Peter and, Je- and, and John come to make sure that this was of God. And it is, and they're preaching, and more and more people every day. And here we're going to see again in Acts 10 that Peter is using the keys of, the, of heaven, the gospel being preached to bring people into a relationship with Christ and ultimately give them access to heaven. It's been about 10 years, and that's one thing I always wonder, how long what was it? You know, the, when you read the Bible and you read the book of Acts, you think it's like boom, 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 story, right one right after another. It took some time. This was probably close to about 10 years after Pentecost that this is happening. The apostles you know, have been spending most of their time taking the gospel to the Jews, and now they're going to be taking it to the Gentiles, which is what they were supposed to do from the start. When Jesus gave the Great Commission, he says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Samaria and Judea and to the ends of the earth. You know, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not just supposed to stay in Jerusalem. It's not supposed to just stay in Israel. It's supposed to go everywhere. Not just to the Jews, but to everyone. And you think, man, why didn't it, you know, why didn't it happen right away? You know, they get the gospel and, and, and 3,000 come to Christ and 5,000 come to Christ. Why didn't they just get going and just start telling everybody? But you've got to understand that God has his timing. God has his plan, and we don't always understand it. And I'll be honest with you, I very rarely understand God's plan because I don't see the big picture. I don't see like God sees. I see like Chris sees. And Chris doesn't always see clearly. Believe me, I admit it. He has his times as well as his plans. And what we're seeing is a transition from a Jewish to a a Samaritan to a Gentile to a worldwide gospel. So we're in Acts chapter 10. I want to begin, obviously, with verse 1. This is what it says. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. At about the ninth hour of the day, which was about three in the afternoon, He saw clearly a vision of an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon a tanner whose house is by the sea. 
When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants, a devout soldier from among those who attended him, and having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Just to give you a little idea of the geography here, Caesarea is about probably about uh, 65 miles northwest of Jerusalem, about 30 miles north of Joppa, where, where Paul is, or I mean where Peter is. It was the Roman capital of Judea province at that time. Jerusalem was not the Roman capital. It was Caesarea. And it, it had some pretty amazing architecture. It was a beautiful, beautiful city. Cornelius is a Roman centurion. He is Roman. He is, he is a Gentile. He lives in the city, but he feared Yahweh. He feared the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he prayed to God, and he gave money to the poor. He was about as close to being Jewish as you could get without being circumcised. He was not a Jewish proselyte. A Jewish proselyte is a, is a Gentile who's becoming Jewish, and the last step they take is they are circumcised. At that point, they can now go to the temple, and they can make sacrifices. He could not. See, there are many people like Cornelius in the ancient world who feared God but were not Jewish. They knew who God was. And this, my friends, was a perfect, the perfect people who were ripe for the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were ripe to hear the message of the word. But it's interesting how a person can be so religious and yet not be saved. He was sincere in his obedience to the law. He was fasting. He was generous to the Jewish people. He prayed from all outward appearances. He would look like a believer in God. He would look like he was saved, according to what they thought was salvation. He was very religious. But like I said, he couldn't offer the sacrifices, so he offered his prayers. In every way, he modeled religious and religion, respectively. And yet, he was not a saved man. See, the difference between Cornelius and many, quote, religious people today is he knew it wasn't enough. I think there are people today who claim to be Christian, who are claim to be religious, who don't even realize that they are lost. They don't know Jesus. He doesn't know them. They don't seek his face. They don't read his word. They don't seek him. They don't want to be in a relationship with him. And yet they consider themselves religious. You ask people today, are you Christian? Well, I go to church. I'm sorry, going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Any more than going to McDonald's makes you a Big Mac. It doesn't. There must be a relationship with Christ. And a relationship, as most of us know, doesn't happen unless you're spending time with that person. We're in our small group, we're talking about abiding. This whole idea, how do you abide? It's about wanting, intentionally wanting to be with Christ. And listening to him. And talking to him. Cornelius was sincere. But it wasn't enough. His good works. His character were good. But not good enough. See because in his prayers. I'm sure Cornelius is asking God. To show him. The way of salvation, and we'll, we'll see that a little bit next week when we get into verse chapter 11. Because Peter is going to reiterate to the council everything that went on, and you'll see some of that. So God sends his angel to instruct Cornelius, go, get this guy named Peter. He's going to tell you everything you need to know, what you need to do. And in true military fashion, what does he do? Immediately. Don't you wish your kids would do that? Oh, I wish my kids would do that. Caleb, he's not here right now. Caleb, go, go do this. Where is he? Oh, he's looking out the window. Okay. 
Cornelius is a military man. When he's told to do something, he does it immediately. So he gets two of his servants. One of them is another soldier who is also faithful. And he sends him, sends them to go and to get Peter in Joppa. Now you might be wondering, if you remember, Philip was in Caesarea. Why didn't God use Philip to reach Cornelius? I mean, why, why doesn't God use certain people that make sense, right? Philip is there. He's preaching the gospel. But we've got to understand that also, you know, the Peter, Peter had the keys to heaven. He was the one that was supposed to be preaching to the Gentiles. Because see, God not only works at the right time, but he works with the right people. He knows better who needs to do what. The question is, are we faithful when he tells us we're the ones who are supposed to do it? Both are essential. The right servant and the right time are essential. So, verse 9. It says, the next day as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter, so the they being the guys that are coming to get Peter are on the road, and Peter is in, a, in the city. He went up to the rooftop about the sixth hour of the day, which is 12 o'clock, noon, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. He did not go to sleep. This is a vision he has. He falls into a trance. And he saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter, he says, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. So apparently on this sheet that he sees coming down, were things that he shouldn't, shouldn't eat. I'm sure there was pig there. There was a, a pig there. So no bacon. He couldn't eat it. There was probably reptiles there. There were things there that a Jewish person would never touch. So Peter says, no, I've, I've never done this. I've always been a good Jew. I've not eaten anything unclean. And the voice came to him again and said second time, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times. And if you know anything about Scripture, anytime there's three things in a row, the same thing said three times in a row, you better listen to it because it's serious, it's important. So God did it three times to him. It says, Now while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise, go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send, you, send for you to come to his house to hear what you have to say. What is interesting about this account is the fact that Peter had to be prepared for what was going to happen. Peter, in his natural, who he was as a Jew, would never even thought about doing this, about going to a Gentile's house. No way. They wouldn't even enter a Gentile's house. God had to prepare Peter for what he was going to experience. See, the, the Gentiles were considered strangers to God and to the promises of Abraham, the promises to David, to the covenant. They were strangers. They, weren't, they had nothing to do with it. They were lost. Remember, if you remember last week, there was a saying, I think it was last week I said this, there was a saying about, about Gentiles among the Jews that the reason Gentiles were created so that there would be firewood for hell. I mean, that's, that was a couple weeks ago. That's actually what they thought. Talk about racism. It was bad. 
The idea of bringing the Gentiles into the family of God was unthinkable for a Jew. So Peter, God had to begin to work on Peter to change his mind, to get him to think differently. Because things were about to change. God was going to declare that there was no difference between Jew or Gentile. Nothing. We are all lost in our sin and we all need a Savior. So i got to ask, what areas of your faith does God need to prepare you for today? Look for those things. What is God God doing today to prepare me for tomorrow? What old thoughts, what old baggage is he trying to change in me so that I could be more effective for him tomorrow? See, God was using a centuries-old regulation on eating something to change Peter's mind. All the way back in Leviticus 11, Peter's mind had to be changed. He had to learn this lesson. So when he has this vision, he sees this food, he hears the command of God to kill, and Peter says, oh, by no means, Lord. He actually told God no. And you can do that. It's wrong. You can tell him no. It's wrong. Again, I wish my kids would understand. You tell me no, it's wrong. It's the same idea. I can imagine God feels the same way when we tell him no. When he says go, I want you to go and do this now. And we say no. I want you you to spend I want you to get up in the morning and I want you to read my word. No. I want you to put down your phone, get off your computer, and spend some time with me. No. It's wrong. You cannot say no Lord if he is truly the Lord of your life. If Jesus is Lord of your life, you only can say yes. That's the test. If you're going to say no to God, he's not Lord of your life. So what does Peter do? He's up there. He sees the vision. He he hears the guys calling his name. And God says, these are the ones. I've sent these guys to you. So what does he do? It tells us in verse 23. He says, so he invited them in to be his guest. Whoa! You understand how mind-blowing that is? He is a Jew. A Jew would never invite a Gentile into his house to stay with him. What does Peter do? He invites them in to stay the night. And you must understand, in, in the tradition in the Middle East during this time, is if you brought a guest into your home, they were treated better than your family. They were your honored guest. You would give up your bed your clothes, uh, you know the story of Lot. When the angels came, what did he say? He offered his daughters instead of these men. We think, why would he do that? That's, that's how important the visitors into your home. So Peter is honoring these Gentiles. The change is beginning to happen already. The next day he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. So not just Peter went, but some of the brothers went with him. And on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting him and had gathered together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for the Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. They had not told him yet why they had sent for him. And Cornelius said, 
Four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by God. The Lord. Now, it takes about two days to get from Joppa to Caesarea. So in that time, Cornelius is getting excited. So what does he do? He calls his family and all his friends to come and hear Peter. Before he even becomes a believer in Christ, he's an evangelist. Kind of kind of makes me upset with me if, I mean, I can't even go to my neighbor and tell him about Christ when here this man doesn't even believe yet. And he's asking, actually bringing his whole family and all his friends in to hear about Jesus. He's a witness even before he's a Christian. But I want to emphasize a couple key truths here that are in these in these few verses, in this section of these verses. First of all, I want this idea that one religion is as good as another is completely false. Those who say that we, sh we, can, we, sh we can worship any God, that God is God is everywhere, God is everything, and, and the God, of, God of, of, of Islam is the God of Israel and the God of Christians is false. That's not true. That we shouldn't change other people's religions. I'm sorry, but that goes completely contrary to Scripture. Scripture never tells us that we should not share the gospel, that we should not go to somebody because they need it, because Jesus is the only way. And if we truly love someone, we're going to give them the way to eternal life. Salvation is for the Jews, according to John 4.22. And there could be no salvation apart from Christ, who was born a Jew. See, Cornelius, he had piety. He had religion. He had morality. But he didn't have salvation. He was a good person. If anybody can truly be good, which I don't think we can. Jesus says, there's no one good but the Father. Why do you call me good? In our humanness, we are not good. Just look at our society today, and you tell me we're good. The only reason why we seem to be good is by the grace of God, the general grace that's on this world. Once that's taken away, look out. Some people might say, leave Cornelius. He should have just left him alone. He would have been fine. I mean... <laughs> Especially, I mean, at least Cornelius was believing in God. At least he wasn't like the pagan Romans who had multiple gods. But that's part of his culture. Why would you change someone's culture? It's a shame. See, God doesn't see it that way. Because apart from hearing the gospel message of Christ, there's no hope. You're dead. You're dying in your sins. You are condemned to hell. We don't like to say that, but that's the truth. I want the truth. Oh, man, do I want the truth. I want the truth today and what we're going through. I don't get it. I don't get the truth. But I can get the truth in the gospel. And the gospel is God loves us. He died for us. He sent his son for us. We need to believe in him. He wants to have a relationship with us so that we can live with him forever. And in the meantime, I get the joy of walking with him in this life. And yeah, is my life going to be crap sometimes? Pardon my French. That's not French, but it'd be crape, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it is. Believe me, I've, I had a rough morning this morning. Everybody's not here. People are not here. My wife has been crazy trying to get somebody. To, she had to teach when she wasn't going to teach. It's been a crazy morning. But you know what? Soundboard worked, didn't it, Ed? <laughs> For once. It's a good thing. I'm in a good mood. You know, 
because I love Jesus and I have him and that's all that matters. I need, that's all I need. Everything else, all the good things in my life are bonus as long as I have Jesus. And all the bad things in my life are bonus because they teach me. They teach me to love him and serve him and grab on and hold on to him even more. That's why we tell people about the gospel. So all religions lead to God is a falsehood. Secondly, a seeking Savior will find a seeking sinner. Whoever's searching in their heart for God, God is searching for you. We think this, you know, when I was growing up, it was like, you know, seek God. You know, I, I found God. I, I found Christ. No, you didn't find Christ. He found you. You just finally opened your eyes and realized he's there for you. He seeks you. He calls you. He loves you. He knows you. He wants you. And through much, much of my life, I'm blind to it. But if you're seeking him, you will find him because he's looking for you too. It's essential that as children of God that we share his word with people. I don't mean we've got to get a, you know, this is a pretty good sized Bible and I've got to thump people in the head with it. That's not it. All I have to do is share a little bit. You know, Jesus, Jesus does love you. That's all, that's all it takes. Because God is seeking them too and the Holy Spirit's working on them too. They're just waiting for that right word to change them. And to push them to that point where they're actually seeking after God. You never know when your witness to Christ is exactly what somebody needs to put them over to that point where they're actually seeking God. And thirdly, the third thing I want to say before we go on is Peter was certainly privileged to be allowed to preach to a model congregation. These people were ready to hear the word. Now, I'll preach the word. I don't care. If you're willing to hear it, fine. If not, fine. But I want to tell you, when I know that your hearts are ready, it's even better. And I feel privileged to be a pastor. I'm sure Tim and Sherry have felt that at the nursing home when they see the people and know their hearts are ready to hear God's message. And they see the effect afterwards. You're like, yes, yes. Peter was very privileged to have a congregation who was ready and willing to hear his word. Chapter, uh, verse 34. So Peter opened his mouth. And here's what he said. He said, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. We learn later, Paul says, you know, there's, neither, there's no, the, neither Jew nor Greek, male or female, slave or free. There's neither black or white, Hispanic, child, adult. There's nothing, nothing that separates us as children of God. He says, but I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, you yourselves know what, I happened, what happened throughout all Judea, which is interesting. They know the story of Jesus. Beginning with Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed. They know the life of Jesus, but they don't know all the details. But Peter does, because he was there. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. Now that they know. But what they don't know is, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who have been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins 
through his name. There is no faith apart from the gospel. There is no faith apart from the gospel. If you say you believe in Jesus and you don't believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have fooled yourself. There is no faith apart from the gospel. God is no respecter of persons when it comes to faith, when it comes to race and, and nationality, when it comes to sin and salvation. There's no difference. We're all lost. Well, I'm not as bad as that person. <laughs> yes, you are. There's no difference. God loves us all and wants us all to come to faith. We have all the same creator. We need the same savior. Whether we're born here in the United States or whether we're born in Baghdad, Iraq. We all need the same savior. I want to kind of Mention here in verse 35. It says, but in every nation, everyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. I want you to make sure you understand, Peter is not preaching works salvation. He's not preaching righteousness by what we do. Because it says, fears him and does to fear God and to be righteous, to do righteous works, is the life of a believer. Back in Micah, Chapter 6, verse 8, he says, He has told you, old man. He said, God, not old man, O oh man. He has told you. God has told you what is good. He's told you what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Listen to this. What does God require of you? He requires that you do justice, that you love kindness, and that you walk humbly with your God. On Saturday morning at the guys' group, we were in. We're just starting the book of Job. And any of you guys, please join us. It's great to sit and talk about the book of Job. And it says that Job was blameless. I talked about that in my prayer. Job was blameless, and he walked with God, and he, he, he did not seek evil. He turned away from evil. That's what God requires of us. And it takes intentionality. We must be intentional about it. You can't go about your life lackadaisical and just willy-nilly. You must be intentional. Our faith, our faith is the evidence of a right, evidence of our, I'm sorry. Our faith is evidenced by our righteous walk. In other words, if you are walking righteously, that shows you have faith in Christ. So you wonder if you're saved? You wonder, you look at your walk. I'm not going to look at your walk and say, huh, not unless you want to come to me and you want to tell me all your dirty laundry, which I don't really want you to do because it'll depress me because I'll look and say, yeah, that's me too. I'm doing the same thing. Look at your life. Look at your walk. Look at your thoughts. Are you being righteous in your thoughts? Not self-righteous. Righteous. Are you having good thoughts? Do you think evil things? Not intentionally. It's never intentional. But do you think those things? Do you get angry at people? Or do you say things that you shouldn't say? Then your, your walk is evidence of a faith that's struggling then. And you need to work on your faith and your relationship and abiding in Christ. Then Peter goes on to summarize the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. He makes clear that Israel was God's instrument for accomplishing his work. But that Jesus is the Lord of all. All means all. Everyone. And not just Lord of the Jews. Peter then shares the good news that whoever believes in Jesus will be saved. I know. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? Well, that means you actually trust him for your salvation. You know, you know you cannot be saved on your own. You know that I can't be good enough. And so what do I do? i got to trust in Jesus because Jesus is the one who died for me. And I trust him. I confess my sins to him. And he's faithful and just to forgive me my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. 
We were talking about this on Saturday with the guys that said, listen, how did, how did Job walk blameless? I thought it was impossible not to sin. But it says, he's blameless. I said, I think it is possible not to sin, but I can tell you what, I may not sin at this moment, but I gotta watch it because the next moment I may sin. It's not that I haven't sinned, I'm a sinner. It's that I need to walk blameless with God and I need him to intentionally, intentionally not seek evil. And then I can be blameless before God. Through Christ, because apart from him, what can I do? Nothing. So it takes my belief in Christ, trusting in him to show me, to walk with me daily, moment by moment, so I can be blameless before God. And when I do make a mistake, guess what? His sin, his, my sin is atoned by his blood. And I'm forgiven, and it's gone. So at that moment, I'm blameless. Do I sin again? Probably so, because I'm human. I'm not perfect. I never said, never said you had to be perfect. You had to be blameless through Christ. Not perfect. Verse 44. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed. So all the guys who came from Joppa were totally amazed because the Holy Spirit fell upon them. Because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for, for, for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and they asked him to remain for some days. Notice in verse 44, Peter's in the middle of his preaching. What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit butts in and says, Boom! <laughs> I've, I've poured myself out upon them. Wow. Could you imagine? I know some of you wish that the Holy Spirit would pour himself out on and, and interrupt me sometimes. That's okay. But that's what he did. He didn't wait for Peter to finish. Before he had a chance to finish his sermon, the Holy Spirit, Spirit stepped in. And he gave witness to the Jews that these people can receive the Holy Spirit. The Gentiles have the Holy Spirit. They're truly born again. After all, these men had not seen the vision that Peter had. Because Peter had come to understand that the Gentiles too were going to be part of God's family. And they are on equal footing with the Jews. Now, I want you to understand, this does not say that every person who comes to Christ will immediately have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on them so much that they speak in tongues. Do I believe that speaking in tongues can happen? Yes, I do. Do I believe it's common? No, I don't. I don't know why. I don't understand why the Holy Spirit. Remember earlier, I don't understand God's plans. I understand why God doesn't do it now. Wouldn't it be a lot easier if, if we would just all start speaking in tongues? Do we know the Holy Spirit would pour it out? But the problem with that is we have a tendency to want it too much and we fake it. I think that's what's happening a lot today in some Pentecostal churches. It's being faked because they want to be part of it so much. But I want to be honest with you. There is a way for us to speak in a tongue that glorifies God even more. And that's when we share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those who don't know it then we are speaking for Christ and we are glorifying God in the process. So in a way, we do speak in tongues. We speak the gospel, which is foreign to the people we're speaking it to sometimes. Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. This whole event that we're seeing here with Cornelius is mirroring Pentecost. This is like a Gentile Pentecost. And the same spirit who came on the Jewish believers is the same one who came on the Gentiles. No wonder the men were astonished. And so we're seeing this transition in the history of the church from being a Jewish church to being a Gentile and Jewish church. 
Believers now among the Jews, the Samaritans, the Gentiles, they've all received the Holy Spirit. And they're united in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we're all made to drink of one spirit. Understand too, these Gentiles were not saved by baptism. The Holy Spirit came on them first. Then they were baptized. Can the Holy Spirit come on, you know, come upon you, be in you at baptism? Sure. I don't limit him. But you don't have to be baptized in order to receive the Holy Spirit. That's proof right there. God intentionally did this so that we don't get wrapped up. We don't get so wrapped up in the processes that we forget the person. The person being baptized and the person of Jesus Christ. Understand, sinners have always come to salvation by faith. That is the one principle God has never and will never change. It is only through faith in Jesus Christ that you become saved, not baptism, not laying on of hands, not by somebody hitting you in the forehead and you falling backwards. But you must understand, God does change his method of operations as is clearly seen in Acts chapters 1 through 10. It's not the same old story now as things are changing. But understand, the same principle holds true. It's by faith you have been saved. It's by grace through faith. Um, we're going past that. So Peter stayed in Caesarea. He helped the people, these new believers, understand the truth of the word. Don't just, don't just lead someone to Christ and then leave them out in the open. Don't just, don't just tell someone about Jesus and say, well, then you need to find a church to be involved in. You need to lead them, and you need to walk with them. Peter did. The entire experience is an illustration of the Great Commission being fulfilled. God sent us to make disciples, to teach the Gentiles. Then he baptized them, and he taught them the word. And that same commission applies today. But the question is, are you and I willing to fulfill it? So what's our takeaways from today? First of all, God has his timing as well as his plans. You will not always understand it, but you need to walk in it. A person can be religious and still not be saved. God not only works at the right time, but he also works through the right servant, and both are essential. Sometimes we, uh, what we go through is God preparing us for the next leg of our journey. And sometimes, man, I hate what he's doing to prepare me. But I know that it's good. It's for my good that he's doing it. The seeking Savior will, will find the seeking sinner, or the seeking sinner will find the seeking Savior. There can be no faith apart from the gospel. Our faith is evidenced by a righteous walk. You want to know if your faith is real? What's your walk? Look at your walk. What's your fruit? Are you bearing fruit? Sinners have always been saved by faith. And that is the one principle God will never change. Let's pray. Father, we praise you today. Lord, we know that you are a righteous God and you want us to be holy as you are holy. But we also know, Lord, that we can't do it on our own. We need a Savior. We need you, Lord, to Show us, to walk with us. You've prepared us. Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2 says, you know, we were created in Christ Jesus for good works that you prepared beforehand for us to walk in. We need you to walk with us, to show us, to teach us, to lead us, so that we can lead others to you and you can walk with them as we walk with them. In a place as Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Lord, please help us to, to realize that we need you. That you reign on high. That we need to long for you as the deer pants for water. And we need to share 
our faith with those around us. As Cornelius called in his whole family and all his friends in anticipation, not really even knowing what Peter was going to tell him, and yet in anticipation of knowing that what Peter had to tell him must be pretty awesome for God to tell me to do this. It is awesome. The gospel is amazing. It's the good news that the world needs today. More than ever, I think the world needs to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Help us to be that light that shines in this dark world. And we pray this in your name. Amen. May God bless you this week. Go in peace.